Well, hello, and welcome to episode 175 of Drink the Movies. That sounds monumental, uh, Michaela. Uh, Brian and Michaela here with you again, as always. And this week, Michaela, we are uh, we're taking a trip uh, to the uh, African continent, taking some beautiful images uh, recorded by one uh, Sidney Pollock, put to film and to tell of one of the greatest love stories of them all. Maybe definitely one of the greatest uh, lion stories of them all. That's true. That is absolutely true. And that is out of Africa. Um Super excited to share this with you. I remember um, seeing this a lot as a kid. Um, I really loved film, right? I didn't have regular television. So I watched a lot of movies. Some of them were really long. Some of them were two hours and like 42 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. And some of them were called Out of Africa by Sidney Pollack. And I remember seeing this and really just being in love with the spectacle of movie making at that time with... Um, this film is older. It's it doesn't have a lot of. It does. I don't think it has any special effects. It's got a little bit of makeup <laughs> in it because people get old. It's supposed to be like this epic anthem of a woman's life. Um, and we're going to talk about whether or not it actually does that. But I was so excited uh, because I was cleaning out uh, some things with my my parents' house and I found my original VHS tape. But I think I just mm -hmm. shared a picture of it with you. And mm -hmm. the thing that you immediately wrote back was, "I can't believe it's only on one." <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because it's really long. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I remember like the the Titanic came in like a double box set because it was so long. I was like, how did they get all that onto one VHS? They were using a slow play. Uh, that's a deep cut out there for anyone old enough to remember uh, VHS tapes. Uh, so let's do this, Michaela. We're gonna we're gonna if we're gonna make our way, uh, you know, uh, to Africa, out of Africa, to talk about you know all the things that happen uh, in this film. We're definitely going to need a cocktail. So let's do this. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back to whip up this week's drink. So Brian, yes, am I am I starting? You that okay. was a that startled me as much as uh, as Karen gets startled when she just instantly gets married in the film. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, what is not startling is how great this cocktail is that we found. Um, mm -hmm. It's called the Out of Africa, uh, which is uh, aptly named. You know, I feel like we've done a couple of. Um, African based or, you know, wanting to kind of showcase the the colors of Africa, right? When we did um, Lion King a couple of weeks ago, and this is kind of no different. This is a much more adult version of uh, of that mocktail. Um, That's true. It, it calls for two and a half ounces of safari liquor or liqueur, um, which uh, I had never heard of before, but I thought mm -hmm. that would be mm -hmm. great because they do a lot of... Um, sort of safari work when Karen and Dennis are out on, on safari, they're out looking at the land and um, doing a bunch of different, different things, either trying to help, um, I don't know, the British army or uh, give supplies to her, her lying, cheating husband, whatever. Um, yeah. But the safari liqueur, I couldn't find anywhere. Um, I did some research on what that profile would look like. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a fruity mango papaya thing. Um, yep. It's that looked really good. If you're able to find it, any of you listeners, let us know where you found it because we'd love to be able to actually do the drink the way it was intended. But yeah, it's a super niche uh, liqueur, and yeah, it's it's from the Netherlands, uh, which makes it, and it's a blend of like mango, papaya, passion fruit, and lime. Uh, so you can you can definitely check that out if you want to. Uh, I was unable to find it here um, in our part of the world. Uh, Michaela, you were unable to find it uh, in Texas, which is kind of surprising because a lot of uh, importers uh, go through like Texas. So I thought you might have had a little bit better uh, luck than I did. Um, but yeah, check that one out if you can't find it. You can definitely substitute just any of those kind of like tropical fruit uh, liqueurs. I use like a Gifford uh passion fruits and uh the giffords grapefruit i just kind of did like half and half of each of those oh that would have been good okay excellent that that adds some acidity as well to the umptiousness of like the passion fruit piece which would be good mm -hmm. right yeah so you're gonna take two and a half ounces of that uh two and a half ounces of your favorite vodka four and a half ounces of pineapple juice and then two dashes of grenadine, just enough to color it just a little bit, right? Um, mm -hmm. And um, then you're going to serve this uh, with blended ice. You could use crushed ice if you if you if you want. Um, if you have a, a way to do that, I think that that is uh, it adds kind of an extra. I don't know. Uh, what's the word? Um, 
it's just it's it's it cuts into the umptiousness a little bit, which is good if it's a thousand degrees. And I mm-hmm. I've never been to Africa, but I imagine in Kenya, uh, you need a lot of ice in the middle of the summer. <laughs> You definitely, yeah, you definitely need a lot of ice. Um, the reason you'd use crushed ice in something like this is because it's going to uh, get a little bit more ice melt in there, which you're definitely going to need because this is a very like booze forward drink. I was looking at it, yeah. you know, initially, Michaela, and I'm like, I'm like, that's a lot of liquid uh, for like one cocktail. So is this meant to be two cocktails? Uh, is this meant to be blended? But no, I think uh, literally just served over like some crushed ice, right? You can either, uh, if your like refrigerator will do like crushed ice for you, or you can get like one of those uh, like little like sacks that you like put ice cubes into and like uh, beat them up. You can do that or you can blend some ice like in your blender if you wanted to, if you had a, a good quality uh, blender there. Um, some of the cocktails we saw for the out of Africa cocktail included uh, orange or grapefruit juice in there. So you can play around with that uh, if you want. But this was pretty good. It kind of reminded me of, you know, a lot of these cocktails we've been doing, you know, the last couple of weeks, a lot of this, you know, pineapple, uh, you know, kind of, uh, like like Caribbean uh, type of flavors uh, in this one. But I like this one because it, it omits the rum. So it's a little bit different. It's a little bit cleaner tasting, you know, kind of that, uh, you know, those, uh, those uh the fruits right the the passion fruits uh, i would imagine you know like the mango the papaya are going to come through a little bit uh cleaner in this uh with that and then yeah it's this really nice kind of just just slightly like blushed color there from the couple of drops of grenadine uh it doesn't really add anything to the flavor so if you didn't have grenadine on hand you could totally make this up it's not going to change the flavor of it too much it's just going to be a little bit more of that you know pale yellow color you know the same color as those lions that meryl streep's going to shoot in the movie that's right (laughs) that's right uh yeah spoiler um yeah, uh, they they did, you know, run after her. So it was self-defense. Um, but yeah, I really liked this one. Um, I thought it's it's a really simple drink. It's easy to make. Um, I am a little bummed that I wasn't able to get my hands on the safari liqueur because um, I think that would have definitely added uh, an extra kind of layer of profile flavor mm-hmm. to talk about. Yeah, for sure. And it is really good. I've had it uh, before in New York when I worked at a liquor store up there. We carried it. So I was able to taste it uh, before. But yeah, just unable to find it uh, now. So keep your eyes peeled out there. If you pick up a bottle of it, let us know where you got it and let us know what you think about it. Uh, mix up an out of Africa cocktail. Let us know what you think about that. But Michaela, what we're going to need to do is we're we're going to need at least like, I don't know, like four or five of these to make it all the way through this movie. So let's go ahead. We'll <laughs> mix up a, a couple of these and we'll be right back to chat about this week's film out of Africa. You do like to change things, don't you? For the better, I hope. I want my Kikuyu to learn to read. Buy Kikuyu. Buy Limoges. Buy Farm. It's an awful lot to own, isn't it? I have paid a price for everything I own. And what is it exactly that's yours? We're not owners here, Karen. We're just passing through. Is life really so damn simple for you, Finch Hart? Perhaps I ask less of it than you do. I don't believe that at all. Spoiler warning for Out of Africa. If you've not yet seen this film, uh, you've had a lot of time to do it because it was released in 1985. Uh, But we're going to talk about all the things. We're going to talk about um, the end. It's not really a... It's not really a twist, but we're going to talk about this epic kind of lifespan of... It's kind of a uh, twist. I mean, it's kind of a twist. Uh, this epic lifespan of, of Karen Blixen and all of the things this is based on a book. Um, but we're going to talk about it and we're going to talk about the beautiful shots that Sidney Pollack has created. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, I'm dying to know what uh, Brian's actual thoughts are on this because, you know, he said it. He, we knew it was going to be real long and I just hope he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your re- spoiler warning. There you go. <laughs> But that's right. I knew it was going to be real long and I knew that it won some Oscars. So, yeah, as you mentioned, Michaela, it was released in 1985, uh, directed by Sidney Pollock, and it stars Meryl Streep as our Danish heiress, Karen Blixen, uh, Klaus Maria Brandauer as Bror, her Swedish Flandering husband, and Robert Redford as Denny, uh, the big game hunter turned lover turned pilot. Uh, Denny, uh, I think in the actual book is supposed to be uh, English. Uh, Robert Redford doesn't even doesn't even go for the accent. Meryl Streep uh, going for the accent uh, in this one yeah. for sure. Uh, she is bringing the uh, that Danish accent uh, to the forefront. But Robert Redford couldn't be bothered. He's like, just look at me. I'm Robert Redford. I'll do what I want. Uh, nominated for 11 Academy Awards, which is pretty good. It won quite a few of those, but it was nominated for and lost Best Film Editing costume design, uh, supporting actor for Brandauer, and 
uh, actress for Meryl Streep there, but it did win. It won sound. It won original score by John Barry. Very classic uh, film score there. Cinematography, art direction, adapted screenplay, and best director and best picture uh, there for Sidney Pollack. So these were the only uh, Oscars Sidney Pollack won after you know being nominated several times uh, for another film. Uh, we talked about Tootsie, you know, way back in the early days of Drink the Movies. So uh, back to chat about one of his films uh, here again. Uh, on a side note, uh, I thought that this was was interesting and uh i don't you know just putting it out there into the world the color purple also had 11 nominations uh that year and didn't win any which seems a uh, a little a little bit of a surprise but maybe not a surprise i guess you're talking about 1986 so let's get into the movie here a little bit uh michaela uh this is uh something that you mentioned kind of at the top it's something that you've loved a long time it is the first time uh that i've ever seen this but we're gonna pick up with uh karen right she is uh there she is uh telling a story a lot of this is kind of told in like like half like narration like narrative uh sort of uh sort of storytelling and half you know what we're seeing unfold on the screen but we're picking up with karen there she is uh at a party and uh basically she is uh coming up with some sort of arrangement with uh Broer, uh her uh groom to be potentially and they say maybe uh we should just uh come along Broer, you're out of money uh you can marry me and have my money which seems like a terrible way terrible foundation uh for a marriage maybe things were different back in like i don't know like 1913 or whenever uh the story takes place here um but uh that's how we're getting started and we are on our way to africa yeah here yeah. let's get let's get married you can take all of my money and we'll move like literally the entire globe away from where we're at right now yeah yeah let's do it um you know i i really like the way this is shot because it's it, it they needed to it's almost it, it's a it's based on a on an actual person right karen blixen was a human was a real mm -hmm. human who was mm -hmm. was was danish um but it's this opening scene is so different than the rest of the film because it is snow covered. Um, it is everyone's wearing fur, like, because it's really cold out. And uh, she and Broer do hatch up this plan, right? Uh, she uh, is, is, has been having uh, an, some sort of love affair with his twin brother. His twin brother doesn't really want to get married. She's really upset. Uh, he's like, Hey, you know, we're really good friends. Maybe we'll be all right. You know, we're friends. Um, and he's like, yeah, let's go to Africa. I don't, I don't really understand the Africa thing. Um, the plan was that they were going to go and, and have a cattle ranch or a cattle farm. Um, and so, uh, she packs up all her things. And I mean, like all her things on this big train, it must've taken six months for her to get all of the, all of her glass and her China and her Limoges, um, mm -hmm. onto various boats and, uh, and, and then onto a train and, uh, it's on this train that she's taken to Kenya uh, that she we first get a glimpse of uh, Dennis Finch Hutton uh, who is uh, putting ivory tusks onto the onto the uh, I don't know the back of the train they just stopped it for him because they like him uh, it's very polite yeah. to do that there um, and she's yeah. freaking out because all of the indigenous people are like all over the the carts you know the big cartons with all of her stuff and you know she's the very um, westernized view at at this point right of mm -hmm. the people that live in the the people that actually <laughs> lived on the land before they got there um she's like oh they're, they're all you know she's she's like get away get away from my my limoges um and, <laughs> and dennis didn't is, know it was limoges yeah yeah he's, he's like well they don't they don't know that baroness it's calm calm down they're not gonna they're not gonna hurt you they're not gonna hurt your stuff chill out oh, no. yeah um, that's right yeah it opens up it's uh it's very gorgeous um it's very like wide landscapes here as they're going on this train across the you know the plains here of uh of kenya on en route to uh nairobi i suppose that they would have moved there because uh i was looking it up i guess you know the the british colonized like uh kenya uh in particular um they set up like the actual like colony i guess like in from like 1920 to 1960 so i suppose that that was uh kind of like the the posh thing to do i guess if you were if you were noble i guess you'd you do that and uh try to uh, stake your claim uh the if we're not going to get into how terrible uh that all was but yeah the uh, kind of opening shots here of this train going across the landscape are absolutely breathtaking um like i said they they kind of stop they pick up the tusks and she is on her way uh then to meet her uh husband to be right uh uh to go meet up with broer there at the party i like she like walks in and it's kind of like this like 
this big lodge sort of a thing and she goes in she's looking for someone and there's like a there's like a one room of this lodge which says, it says like gentlemen's club uh on it or men's club something like that um which is funny because really the whole building is that so i don't know why they needed a separate room but she walks in and this like record scratch er, uh she's like uh they're, they just like escort her out of there <laughs> they're like we will not answer your question just woman be gone with you be gone with you but she does run into broer uh which is good and broer's like hey great you're here let's get married right now <laughs> Yeah, he wants that yeah. cash. He wants that cash. That's what he wants. He wants the cash. Um, but I do find this to be like really indicative of their friendship. She's she's not she's not even put out by that piece, right? She's like, we're getting married like in five minutes, and so she's she puts on this dress. He kind of makes a joke. He's like, I didn't know what color you were going to choose, and she's like, it's ivory, you jerk. Um, and they get married, you know, someone like a, a stranger in this crowd is like, shall I stand up for you? Because she knows nobody. Um, and I think that that really is something that that tells the story when we talk about like a person's shifting mindset, right? When Karen Blixen comes into this country, um, she is very much the epitome of like this colonization, like uh, idea that we have now, right? Where, you know, the indigenous people are just like, uh, uh inconvenient um they she doesn't understand them she doesn't know anybody she doesn't have any friends um she's just trying to kind of make her way and and Broer is like i just want to make all the money um within like two hours of their wedding she immediately says well i'd like to see my house now um and he's like well you need to change because it's like three hours from here so they 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 finally go and she meets all of these servants that are going to be waiting on her hand and foot in this house that's made of stone. It looks like a like a Danish cottage in the middle of Africa, mm -hmm. which I find really interesting. That must have that must have been um, really, I don't know, taken a long time to put together because it is quite like European looking mm -hmm. the house. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they do a really good job of the of the set design here and both in the creation of the the house that's you know, kind of on um, like this, like palatial grounds, kind of almost right. So here in the uh, the African uh, you know, the savanna, basically, and then they do a really good job of like recreating. I don't know how like accurate the town would have been in Nairobi of, but of like recreating this town, and it looks very much like a uh, kind of like a like a mishmash of like a like an old west town that we'd think of like here in the U.S. and also like like a British town, right? Because it look it kind of looks like an old west town, but everything is like like British pubs and uh, things like that. It's kind of throughout uh, this town anytime that they're going into the town square. Um, and yeah, kind of the first introduction is great, so we're getting a little bit more more kind of uh, insight into uh, Denny's character who has kind of like this room uh, there and she's uh, poking through his stuff a little bit before uh, whisked away to her own home to start living her life there, I guess, as uh, the Duchess, uh, Duchess yeah. Blixen, Baroness Blixen. Uh, Baroness Blixen. And and it's really interesting because they get to the house. She meets all um, all of her servants. Um, they are all from a Kukuyo tribe. Um, and so she, you know, she... She doesn't speak their language. She's not really interested in learning anything about them at first. Um, but Broer lets her know that he's managed to uh, change the plan. They're not going to have a cattle farm at all. Um, they're going to plant coffee. And everybody is uh, telling her that, you know, that's never been done this high up, uh, this far north. Um, we don't know if it'll work. It's going to take years before like a single, you know, a yield comes through with the crop. So she's kind of freaking out a little bit. Um and but he's like, hey, you know, um, this is what you wanted. You wanted to be a baroness. I married you. you and this is it. Um, I also really like to go hunt big game uh, on safari. So I'm going to be doing that a lot. Um, and that's kind of the first kind of quarter, I would say, of this film is her mm -hmm. is Karen coming to realize that she's all alone in Africa. Um, the person that she's kind of trusted to help carve out this life with her is not really interested in carving out a life with her at all. Um, not mm -hmm. even as a friend, really. He's, you know, Broer is one of the most interesting characters, I think, in this in this show, because he he's he's not villainized as much as he could be uh, in today's day and age. It, you know, I feel like we would we would dislike him a lot more than we do. Um, but he's he's uh, not interested in, you know, being a partner to her in any way. He gave her a title and they were friends and he's off doing whatever he wants to be doing.
Yeah, exactly. I, I do like there's a little bit of butting heads, right? And she's like, if you're going to keep spending my money, could you at least tell me uh, what you're doing? But he's not that interested in it. Uh, like you mentioned, change the plan to coffee there. So it's going to be a couple years. I really like she's like, what am I meant to do? Like in like in these next four years where I don't have any uh, cash coming in. Uh, her husband now is uh, out of town going on these uh, big game hunts, uh, maybe running into uh, his own uh, love affairs. But, you know, not all is bad, I guess, for Karen, right? She's making some friends, right? She meets uh, Felicity cities played by Susanna Hamilton. I really like kind of their uh, first interaction. Like they meet like originally at the wedding and she's got like her uh, little veil on her face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Karen's like, oh, it's going to keep mosquitoes out. And she's like, yeah, like, yeah, like huge mosquitoes, I guess maybe. But, uh, you know, she's, yeah. she's coming around there you know, uh, being friendly a little bit. She's teaching her, you know, some of the stuff about like the ins and outs of living uh, kind of in this area because Felicity is kind of a wild spirits herself. And she's also uh, meeting some other people, getting to have a couple of occasional run-ins uh, with Denny, which is always good. And uh, she's, uh, you know, kind of like this anointed as like this storyteller uh, kind of a thing, which I think was really meant to drive home the fact that this was, you know, based off of the the book that this lady wrote about her to, you know, kind of really uh, sort of capture that. So we get a couple of really good scenes of her, you know, telling stories around the fire, drinking like giant, huge, like snifters of brandy, like fishbowl sized snifters of brandy. Uh, I really like that if you're, you know, not else, not, not much else to do. Uh, you know, back then. So I guess you just drink brandy, sit by the fire uh, and listen to these stories, which is which is pretty good. Pretty good. You know, what's not good, though, Michaela. It's when Broer is out uh, on safari all the time. Uh, he's deciding that, uh, you know, maybe he can have his cake and eat it, too, uh, so to speak. He's uh, he's spending all the cash. He's going out on safari. He's meeting some ladies. Uh, and eventually he's going to just volunteer himself uh, to go help the English uh, side uh, when World War One breaks out and comes to town because all of the all the English uh, guys there are going to go because apparently the next you know like colony over is like the German colonies that are going to go have a bit of a head so he's like I'm out of here and she's like what are you even you're not even English what are you even talking about and he's like he's like I just don't want to hang out with you basically <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah and he, so he's gone for a while um and then I love I love the scene where you know she's she's on her own. She's trying to make a pond. Um, and of course, the indigenous folks there are trying to explain to her. They're like, this water lives in Mombasa. Like, what do you, what do you, this is going to be really hard. Um, and I love, gosh, I love the dialogue here because it really captures kind of the simplicity with the way people from other, like other cultures communicate and the way that we all miscommunicate because we don't hear what they're trying, what we're trying to say. Mm -hmm. Um and I really love that at the beginning, because she's like, well, we're going to put a pond in. And they're like, what they're trying to explain um, is that this is going to be really difficult to do because the rains are going to come eventually. And this the land's not made to to hold a pond here. But what they just say is this this water lives in Mombasa. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's really meant to not be here. And we should mm -hmm. work with the land instead of like try to change it because we don't we want to put a pond here, white lady. Um um, she tries to uh, tell uh, pe have people come and work for her um, and give them medical treatment. They they're kind of resistant to that. Um, I really love how she starts to kind of fall in love with the people and the land slowly over time. And I think this sh this movie really shows how a person can change um, from being kind of this this. Uh, quintessential white person coming into a place that they were not asked to join and asked to visit and kind of commandeer the land, but then also realize the the mistake in doing that and the way in which um, her love for the Kikuyu people just grows over time, right? I really love that 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 starts to happen while Broer is away. And then mm -hmm. there's some captain who comes and says hey broer uh is at the front lines or at, at at some place in africa and they need a bunch of things um go tell somebody and you know uh get 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 a get a group together to like bring us all of these i don't know they, they were like we need three of everything or something and she's like um do you know where he is like is he alive <laughs> and they're like yeah just bring the stuff just, yeah, just, just bring, bring the stuff, stuff. I, I love the uh I don't whoever the the captain or whoever that comes to tell her that that he wants this stuff and she's like is he alive and the guy's like well he sent this letter so obviously lady what are you even talking about um but she takes it upon herself to get the stuff there you get kind of a uh 
pretty good little like caravan uh scene right so see him kind of camping along moving this giant uh herd of like oxen uh you know with all these wagons across she has another uh run in with denny and uh run in with a uh, lion uh kind of in the meantime in this right she's out uh wandering about and uh denny kind of shows up with gun pulled and just like eh, well we'll see what the lion does uh you know right let him let her let that lioness get a couple more feet to you uh but eventually it scampers off and you get a couple of uh you know pretty good little campfire scenes you start to see kind of like this friendship between her and denny bloom a little bit but he's you know he's off on his own adventures he gives her a compass and he says uh you know just uh look at the horizon goes south southwest or something like that for uh three days and and you'll be there which you know, you know, close enough, close enough. Sure. Uh, that sounds right. So she gets there. She turns up. Uh, Broar could not be like any less excited to see her that she was the one that did that because A, it's dangerous. And uh, B, uh, she's probably going to interfere with all the ladies. He's got himself uh, running around uh, there anyway. But that was kind of the first like big adventure. And kind of now at this point, I guess Karen has like cemented herself into uh, the life that she is going to be living uh, in the rest of the film. Yeah. I love the conversation that she and Brewer have where she's like, you know, you're not going to come back and you're not going to help with the farm. And, and he says, no, I'm, I'm really not. And she's like, I could force you. And he says, ah, I'll just hunt professionally. Like, yeah, you know, I, this, that's not what I want. And <laughs> Brewer's really good at calling bluffs, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. He's like, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I will be doing that. And, um, but it, it's interesting because they both also admit in this moment in this tent, they're like, I really She's like, I didn't expect to like you so much. Like, and I really, I, I really like you. And he's like, yeah, I really like you too. You know, there's some consummating of their relationship. Um, she ends up leaving him to, to go back home. She returns home safely uh, just in time to like collapse in the middle of a lawn. Um, the first time I saw this, I, it happened so fast. Um, and that's one thing I think critic, if I could be critical of this film, I, I think that there's so much that happens in this two and a half hour um, epic kind of story. There are some scenes that are actually pretty important that happen in like 30 seconds or less. And you're, you're, you're not, um, you're not able to process it. And mm -hmm. so this is a film that I have really enjoyed watching over and over again, because it helped me process watching it the first time. Um, I think that they could have spent more time on certain aspects of it, like when Karen uh, contracts syphilis, right? Um, there's this whole scene where she's at a doctor and the doctor is explaining it to her, but you kind of feel very um, jolted and disjointed because you're like, wait a minute, everything was fine a minute ago. And it's because mm -hmm. there's this 30-second scene where she falls to the ground. And, and so you're not really... Um, you're not able to process it as, as well as an audience member as I think you could if they had elongated that. And that's just one example of a couple of big changes that happen in the movie that um, right. mm -hmm. I think they could have expanded the front end of that change a little bit so that you can process the end of that change a bit better, if that makes sense, Brian. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about about that and kind of the way that the story is presented as we uh, make our way through the film. But yeah, you mentioned, you know, she gets syphilis, right? You uh, you travel for like uh, five days uh, through hostile uh, territory to get your uh, husband the supplies that he wanted. And what does he give you in return? It's syphilis. Bomp, bomp. So uh, she goes to the doctor. Uh, he's like, uh, you have syphilis. That's pretty bad. Uh, probably going to die if you don't get back to uh, Denmark uh, and get treated. Uh, for this which seems bad because it feels like it's going to take a long time to get to Denmark uh, on a side yep. note so he's like he's like here's like some tablets that might help you a little bit he pours out like a huge glass of Jameson uh, for him if you don't want to make the uh, out of Africa cocktail just go ahead and pour yourself a hefty dose of Jameson that'll be good too uh, that'll be good too I guess that's pr probably pretty good for processing the bad news that your uh, husband gave you syphilis I suppose so uh, she's on her way out right she goes she has a little bit of a chat with uh, Denny I really like um Meryl Streep's so like amazing at this because you know that she feels awful and like she looks like in her face that she feels awful, but she's trying to keep like keep it like her cool. She doesn't want to let it on that, uh, you know, obviously that she has uh, syphilis in front of this uh, dude that she's uh, starting to uh, uh, really start to, you know, kind of have the uh, blossoming love there. But she is off on her way back to to Denmark, right, to, uh, yeah. to get treated for this this stuff. Um, We don't really see any of that, but, uh, you know, eventually uh, she turns back up and, you know, Broer is there uh, kind of taking care of the farm kind of uh doesn't really care we see uh them going like out on the town like at uh, christmas time and then to a new year's eve uh party soiree kind of a thing and uh you see Broer even there is like <laughs> like ditching out like stepping out of the party yep. uh like with yep. some other lady but luckily you know denny is there for a dance and a smooch that'll be good yeah 
Uh, so this is when things really kind of take a turn for me um, watching the kind of relationship blossom between Dennis and, and Karen. Um, you know, Broer seems to feel really bad when he finds out because she, she, again, he finally comes home and she's like, I got to go back to Denmark because I have syphilis really bad. You apparently don't have it really bad and you can stay here. Don't really, I don't, I don't quite understand how that works. I guess there's medicine that uh, needs to, that, that can only be, that, that doesn't exist in Africa yet or something. And so that she goes back to Denmark for like three years. Um, and so he feels horrible. He's like, I get, you know, I don't know if you'll live. Okay. I'm really sorry. He seems super happy when she's back. Um, and then you realize that he, you know, he might really like her. But mm -hmm. he does not love her. He doesn't love her in the way that she's wanted to be loved by somebody. She, he is never going to be. He doesn't want to put to labels on it. He doesn't. <laughs> it's a situationship. Um, but she's about had enough. She's like, look, you know, they're on their way back from from that party. And she's like, uh, I see someone's underwear back here. You need to take a place in town. Like, I'm done with you. Um, and good for her. Because, of course, then he's then he's kind of slimy. And he's like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, I'm I'm real sure. Um, <laughs> But this moment with Dennis is great. He's had a few drinks. Um, he is uh, very much a kind of a, a, a whisperer of the indigenous people. He really is their advocate in this really quiet, beautiful way. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he he won't, he's not going to defy the orders of the British crown or anything like that. But he's also like, you know, this is their land. And you, you, when they have that dance, he keeps saying, you know, you want to own a lot of things, Karen, you, mm -hmm. you know, your Limoges, your house, your Kikuyu, because now she's got it in her head that she wants them to learn to read. And while I think that that is um, thought of in, in one way as a really magnanimous thing to do, he's like, you know, they have their own stories. They don't need anything from us. We don't need to teach them. Maybe we could learn a few things, uh, but we mm -hmm. don't need to yeah. teach them anything really. Um, and it's this, beginning of this deepening um because it's an it's an argument or a disagreement that they have but you also feel that it deepens their relationship and that's when they share this kiss and at first you you know she kind of pushes him away and then she kisses him again and it's pretty chaste but you can tell behind it is is something much deeper and that's when things really start to shift in as a as an audience viewer for for what what Dennis actually means to her um you can see when she's you know, putting on her, you know, clothes or taking them off at night and looking into the mirror, she still has his compass um, at her at her table. And she's always looking mm -hmm. at it and touching it like um, he has made a, a huge impact on her already. Right. Yeah, for sure. And with, you know, Broer out of out of the house now, it's going to give her a little bit more uh, time and opportunity to explore this relationship uh, with Denny, right? They're starting to spend a little bit more time at the house and he's going off on a safari and he invites her uh, to go along with him. And it seems like kind of this big uh, camping expedition there, you know, traversing uh, through having their run ins and entanglements uh, with some uh, with some wildlife uh, throughout there. I guess that actually happened earlier, but, um, you know, they're they're out. There's a beautiful scene, scenery shots. I don't know like if these were composite shots or if it's some like like wildlife preserve that they were uh, shooting this in front of but you'll see like literally them like walking like through like in front of like these big herds of you know zebras and giraffes and stuff like that and it looks it looks absolutely uh, epic as they're kind of going through this and exploring you know this this love and relationship a little bit more right the opening up about uh, each other about things uh, you know she uh, lets the cat out of the bag that she got syphilis from this broer and she didn't know how that was going to change her she's not gonna be able to have kids anymore and uh, kind of you know getting to the like emotionality of all this but it seems like they're getting uh closer uh and closer throughout this you know until uh they find a kind of finally consummate uh that bit of a relationship but you know we we've known from the start that broer really was just basically in this for himself and then he is kind of similar uh in that except he doesn't want anything you know in return he's like i just want to you know live my life to to do things i don't want to put like labels on stuff i just want to you know uh i love you obviously you should be able to to see that and that that should be enough right we don't need to do uh anything more than that and uh but unfortunately 
you know, Karen's not uh, cut from that same cloth, so she's going to get rubbed a little bit the wrong way, right? He's going to go out on some some more safaris, right? Uh, he's going to go, uh, you know, taking taking some other ladies out on safari, and she's like, nah, I don't know. I don't know if I like that. I don't know if I can be down, uh, you know, with that, with this, you know, this loving relationship that we have, but I, I kind of want, you know, I want it all. I want it all, and it kind of harkens back to, you know, that conversation that they were having uh, there at that dance. Yeah. Um, she wants... <laughs> I, I love this dynamic that they have. Um, I love watching it unfold because at first it is so beautiful, right? He takes her flying. There's this moment where they see, I mean, these shots are incredible. Um, I have no idea how they did it um, or how long it took for them to get all these shots. Maybe, I, I, I mean, I don't think Africa looks like this anymore. It's been, you know, 40 years or something since this film was made, but it is breathtaking. Some of these shots where they're flying and she lifts up her hand and he, he can see it and he grabs it because he knows that this is a very intimate moment that they're sharing and they're not able to really, you know, they're on a plane, so they're not able to like hug. Um, but he very much uh, is like, you know, I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I mate for life. I just do it one day at a time. Um, and I think, you know, she seems OK with that until Brar comes to her and says, hey, um, would you like to get a divorce? And she's like, why, why would I want to do that now? And he's like, well, I met someone that I really would like to marry. And so poor Karen is like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like no one wants to marry me. Um, and she and Dennis have this really interesting talk over a fire where she says, I would like, so I would have someone of my own. I, you know, mm -hmm. I want to be worth that sacrifice. I want to be worth someone saying, I won't, you know, I, I, I will be tied to you. And he really doesn't like you, you've nailed it, right? The way he explains it. He says, I'm, I'm not going to love you anymore because I'm tied to you. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere, but I'm not, I'm, that's just not, that's not how I love. That's not who I am. Don't ask me to be that person. And it really becomes this cornerstone of decay uh, that, that starts to really flounder their relationship because she wants to be worth that. Um, I love there's a there's a scene where she's mending a, a button on his shirt and he says, you don't have to do that. I, I don't need your I don't need you to do that. And she's like, you know, you don't it's it's not that you don't want anything. It's that you want to have it all. You want your freedom and you want me to be with you at the same time. And mm -hmm. I've learned a thing or two that you haven't. There are some things in life worth having and I want to be one of them. They come at a price and I want to be one of them. And it's really uh, heartbreaking to watch her on one hand, like stand up for herself and what she wants. And on the other hand, do know that that's ultimately going to mean that she's going to lose the greatest love of her life. Yeah. It's going to push him away for sure. And that's exactly what happens, right? Because he is off. He is on his next expedition. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, they had the uh, the airplane there. He's an airplane uh, pilot now. You get uh, very beautiful shots. My, my Probably my favorite shot in the whole whole movie is uh, when that plane goes flying over top of about 50 million flamingos uh, over the water there. That is, that's uh, that's really, really amazing, amazing stuff there. But yeah, he is out uh, on safari, right? So I guess if if that's your job is to, to go be a safari leader, uh, hunter, then you're going to be sent away from for long periods of time. And that is exactly what happens. So that lets her, you know, kind of focus things on the farm. And that seems to be going pretty good because I guess we've progressed at least four years now in the story. And that farm is uh, heaping some pretty big returns banner year for the farm. But bad news, that farm is going to burn down. It uh, doesn't really know how it happened. It doesn't really matter how it happened. She thinks that maybe uh, it is God, you know, just uh, just reminding her that uh, <laughs> nothing really, uh, really good can can ever come of these things. So the farm has burned down. She is out of money. She is divorced. Uh, she is going to have to get out of there. So she starts uh, packing up her stuff, uh, starts to sell it. Uh, when uh, a ghost of her past, uh, Broer comes in to deliver the bad news. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the things that I think happens um, in this is she, she, she does lose everything, right? She loses her plantation she she's going to lose her plantation because the the bank owns it and they she was really expecting that crop to save her but also um now that she has to give that up you know she had 500 she 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 had a thousand acres uh 500 of those she was using uh the other 500 were for the kikuyu to live and now mm -hmm. the bank is going to take all of that and so she spends um a really long time going from you know, potentate to potentate, you know, in, in the British 
uh, I don't know, hierarchy in Africa saying, hey, can someone please like carve out a little bit of land for the Kukuyu to live? And at first, you know, everybody says no. And she finally like literally is begging this new governor. Um, and it, Dennis is there to, to, to kind of speak on her behalf because of course, no one's going to listen to her unless a man says, hey, will you please like hear mm -hmm. her out? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But she finally does secure a space um, for her Kukuyo. So he he comes to see her to make sure that, um, uh, you know, that that part, it, that 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 piece is settled and he wants to say goodbye. He's going to give her a, a, a plane ride over to Mombasa, um, but he doesn't come. And then Broar shows up and, you know, that's that that's only going to be bad. And bad news. I, I, this scene is super hard. It is one of the ones that um, I think they do really well because they take their time explaining the devastation um, that Dennis has died. He died in a plane crash. Um, he was in Sur Suriavo or, uh, and uh, he, he never, you know, he never came back because he was, he passed away in this horrible, I don't know, there was a fire. Um, and so you're not left with a lot of details, but uh one thing I think is interesting about it is Karen says, you know, you've really got a lot of guts for why, why are you the one telling me? And he was like, well, I think I thought I really should be um, as an act of friendship, but also it feels like just, just a, a completely just cutting. Right. Because it's the, it's, yeah, right. I, I, you know, it's this person that didn't want her that didn't treat her well. And he's here mm -hmm. to like, deliver up this to, horrible news to, to like rub it in yeah yeah for sure because they have that uh that kind of last time we see them together right uh when denny comes over and uh they're there at the empty house and and stuff like that and you know you think that maybe uh it is going to move along they can you know kind of dedicate uh themselves to one another and then and then that happens uh, you get a beautiful uh sort of uh, funeral scene there so they're kind of standing up on up on this hilltop which is which is pretty tough um you'll see uh, some of the indigenous uh people there that have come out to pay their respects as well as the people uh, from the town. And then eventually they uh, end up, you know, burying him there up on this hill uh, that they'd been laying at uh, earlier uh, in the film, you know, saying, I believe it's Karen's that says she'd want to be buried uh, right there if something uh, happens to her, if she, gets, if she gets attacked by a lion. And then and then we find out through a, a letter that gets written, you know, that the lions go up there and you see this beautiful, you know, pair of lions that are there, you know, kind of circling around the grave and lay down to look down over this this crest. But uh, yeah, not uh, not great. Karen's uh, expedition to Africa has not gone very well. Right. She ends up uh, divorced. She ends up uh, broke and she ends up on her way uh, back to Denmark to live out her days. And uh, the film closes uh, basically with the statement that, uh, uh, you know, this this was based on a real person and that she never returned to Africa. So uh, that's really where it ends it kind of returns you know back where it started except it's like a it's like the opposite of a rags to riches story it's like a like a riches to rags story and you just spend a lot of time to get right back to the to the same place that you were so in a lot of ways Michaela this is very much indicative of like a slice of life uh movie except this is a real long movie so it's like a whole like pie of life uh basically this one right here yeah I do like the the fact that it kind of comes full circle and at the very beginning, we see a very old Karen in bed writing things down and starting to tell this story. And she says, you know, this this was the hardest story for me to tell because it was it meant so much to me. Uh, and so, you know, if you do any research on who Karen Blixen was, she she wrote all these really amazing books and stories about uh, about Africa. Um, and it's it. I I love to imagine that at the end she was like, now I'm going to tell the one that was most important to me, which was this idea, this great, this great love and loss in her life, uh, through her time that she spent in Africa and how it changed her and, um, for the better. I think right because mm -hmm. she she went from being this quintessential kind of rich, um, woman who you know didn't understand t cultural differences or had had made wanted to make any time for them to someone who literally begged to to have these these people you know have a piece of land since it's theirs right she's like it's it's right. theirs you should give it to them um and you know that if that it, it gives me hope because if a person can change um everybody can change right we can you know that that whole idea of a paradigm shift is is very real for me and it's one of the reasons why i love this movie i i mean obviously i love the the love story in it it's it's very heart-wrenching every time i watch it 
um, when they, they end up kind of not making it because she can't let him be. And he also can't and won't tie himself to her. Right. It seems like such a small thing, but to him, it's very, not very much not. And for her, it's, it's, it, they're, they're kind of diametrically opposed in that one space and it kind of ruins everything. And it, it's, it's really, um, sad, right. But, but very Mm -hmm. beautiful because they gave each other so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is a very beautiful, uh, kind of story and the way that it's presented obviously you know visually it's very stunning um and then you know kind of the kind of the love story and like these little like snippets we get into uh between you know denny and uh karen within the film um it is very long it's uh like two hours and 41 minutes two hours and 42 minutes something like that um and it it feels very long like i'm all down for a slow burn but this uh, like it it feels like the fire like completely goes out uh from time to time like uh, like the wick doesn't doesn't keep going um and i i don't know if that was that was intentional uh on the part obviously um you know and who am i to to question uh Sydney pollock here uh in doing this but yeah it, it felt it felt very very long to me um but kind of the kind of kind of the biggest thing that I didn't like about it. And you mentioned it, you know, specifically uh, kind of uh, there in, in the section where she, you know, contracts syphilis and has to go back home. It seemed like, like most of like the major events were very much like glossed over uh, in favor of, you know, just more like <laughs> quiet <laughs> meandering about through this world. Um, and mm. I feel like, I feel like maybe those could have been highlighted a little bit more and it would have like helped the runtime feel a little bit less lengthy. Right. Cause she'll be like, Oh, and then I spent three months, three months in Denmark, but here I am, you know, walking around the farm for the next like eight minutes of the, of the film. Right. <laughs> so right. it seems like, so it seems like maybe if they could have like dipped into some of like the more like consequential like parts of the story, like it would have helped with the pacing a little bit better for me. Um, of course, you know, movies are paced uh, very differently uh, now. And we still bemoan the fact that movies are two hours and 40 minutes, uh, you know, <laughs> even now, right. Uh, whether they, whether they need yeah. to be or not. But um, I mean, this is, this is a classic, obviously all of those things that won all of those awards and, uh, probably rightly so. I don't know um, that it needed to win, you know, uh, all all eleven, but definitely the ones that it did. The score is is amazing. It's such like a like a classical like Hollywood score. If you if you feel that the cinematography and art direction were uh, spectacular, um, uh, you know, and then obviously as far as the best picture and uh, best director go, there the acting performances are great. Uh, Robert Redford um, is definitely the the highlight of the film for me, even though it didn't get uh, nominated for the Academy Award. There, I really liked uh, kind of his persona um, and like the angle of his story. Um, quite a quite a bit, and I loved kind of the interactions that uh, he had with uh, with Karen, right, with Meryl Streep's character there. I did find her accent a little bit off putting, especially at the beginning of the film when it's really just her and Broer, because you know there's a very big difference between you know uh, Klaus Maria Brandauer, who's uh, German, who has you know kind of this Swedish accent, uh, you know, very kind of uh, German adjacent to uh, Meryl Streep's uh, mm-hmm. uh, attempted a Danish accent. But by the time uh, they're kind of separated more, um, and it's just playing you know her. Uh, you know, accent off against uh, Robert Redford uh, there with just his, you know, American uh, English accent. It, it was much more uh, palatable, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In yeah, a way, yeah. it, it seemed a lot less it seemed a lot less jarring uh, to me from that sense. But yeah, the acting was great. The The writing was really good. Um, and of course, it just it looks absolutely gorgeous. So, yeah, no, I, 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 I hear you. And I think that the critiques are are sound, right? They're valid. I, I hadn't seen it in a while. Um, it is very long. Um, and I think as a kid, it seemed shorter because I would see pockets of it at a time. Mm-hmm. This would have made an amazing series, like a mini series, I think, where you had some breaks um, also for the processing, because we didn't even get to talk about the whole symbolism around um, Barkley, which is a friend of Dennis's. Um mm-hmm. Yep. who is, is there and he gets sick and he dies and that whole like I- idea of like how can you be best friends with someone and you don't you feel like at the end of their life you don't know anything about them like there's that whole piece right that we don't even talk about mm-hmm. um that could have been explored um uh you know uh i i have i have no money as a producer but i'd love to see this uh maybe remade into a series where we could dive into some of those um, like you said, those real life changing moments and dive into what that actually looked like instead of kind of glossing over to get another shot of of the of the, you know, the the Serengeti. Um, I, I really do love 
the musicality, the score is really special. And I didn't realize mm-hmm. how much yeah. I loved it until watching it this time. Um, the shots are beautiful. I mean, I totally understand why it won. Um, I do feel that it is a slower burn. And as an adult, I, I did get weary towards the end. I um, mean, it did hit me as epic as it had as a ch- as a child and probably because as a kid i didn't have three hours to dedicate to one sitting of it right i would watch a little before right. or after school or something like that um mm-hmm. so maybe maybe that's it but i still i still have just a lot of love for this movie it's it was a movie that i would watch with my grandmother she really loved robert redford um his quiet like he he has cornered the market on the casually sensitive kind of guy right he mm-hmm. doesn't say yeah. a lot. He doesn't he doesn't overflow and tell her all the things he loves about her. I mean, he's the opposite of me, right? Like I am just a giant nerve pouring how much I love somebody. Even if I'm just friends with him, I'm like, I love you so much. And he's right. just like very quiet, very understated. But when he says things, you really listen. Um and it 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 packs a bigger punch. It's so much more impactful than me or, you know, or Karen, who's like spewing all this stuff, right? Um, right. And and that that was so special back then. I mean, this this character, I think, has been a this 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 portrayal of Dennis has been kind of tried to be redone over and over in other characters that we see, you know, 30 years now. Um, mm-hmm. And Robert Redford was the one that did it best for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's definitely it's definitely worth worth the watch if you've never seen it or if you've seen it again, it's it's probably you know, worthwhile to go back and rewatch just to see what you think about it, you know, with a, with a more kind of updated uh, feeling on, you know, the way that uh, movies go. Um, this reminded me a lot of um, Jack and Rose's uh, story in Titanic. I see a lot of uh, parallels kind of, kind of b- between that uh, as well. Speaking of long movies, uh, that one doesn't feel as long though. I don't think so. Uh, but that is going to wrap it up here for out of Africa. Uh, definitely go check it out. Definitely let us know what you think about the Academy Awards. It won or didn't won or won over top of the color purple. And let us know if you have an out of Africa cocktail. Uh, you can do that on any of our social medias. It's at drink the movies on Instagram and X and threads and blue sky and facebook.com slash drink the movies. Uh, you want to check, Check out the merchandise shop. We've got a lot of cool stuff in there. You can do that. It's drinkthemovies.square.site. And if you want to check out the Patreon, that's a really great way to support the podcast, get some bonus material, uh, come to our hangouts, get extra episodes, all that stuff. You can do that on our website. You can do that on our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash drink the movies. And you want to make sure that you are subscribed uh, to the podcast feed. Uh, so that way you're getting all the drops a week. We do our lobby bars every week on Monday, generally. And our main episodes come out on Thursday where we deep dive about things like out of Africa. So, Michaela, where do they need to do that? You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Good Pods, anywhere where Spotify podcasts are distributed and supported. Um, if you're listening to us right now, I guarantee there is a subscribe button that you can press. If you're really liking us, uh, there's probably like a five-star review button that you can press or a like button or a share button. Um, we're able to do this only because, uh, people like you listen and tell other people to also listen. Um, it's the best job of the world. I'm so grateful, uh, to you all to, to be continuing to listen 175 episodes in. It's a lot. (laughs) Um, And uh, we couldn't do it without your support. So we're so grateful. Uh, Thank you for keeping all the Drink the Movie stuff out there. Absolutely. So that's going to wrap it up here for Out of Africa. Thank you so much for tuning in to this one. And we will talk to you next time on Drink Drink the the movies. Movies. He was not our. He was not mine. My favorite issue. She got that little owl for a pet. Little pet owl. Now I want a pet owl. That's pretty cute. Yeah. That's pretty cute. Probably where, uh, what's her name, got the idea from. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Little baby owl. So cute, though. It's like tiny, you know? <laughs> she just, just carries it around. Yeah. <laughs>